Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, all of you. I'm Rajan Dravel, EPSA Education Committee Chair, and I am here to introduce Lunan, who is going to offer a webinar session number seven of 2019 CDs. The title is Opportunities and Pitfall of Using Building Performance Simulation in Exploratory Explorative R&D context. All of us, those who are in uh, academics and R&D, we do use simulation effectively in uh, R&D context. And uh, Lunan is going to talk about uh, the topic, which is based on the, the webinar is based on a paper which has been published in a general of building performance simulation, a special edition. I also wish to inform all of you that Ibibsa is really looking for supporting membership. Please log on to Ibibsa website and register as a supporting member of Ibibsa. All of you must be aware about our conference, which is coming up in Rome in September. And I'm sure that I'm going to see many of you during that time. But right now, let's hear what Lunan wants to say about the opportunities and pitfalls in R&D context. Over to Lunan. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Rol Lonen. I'm an assistant professor at Eindhoven University of Technology. And today I would like to discuss the paper that was published in the special issue of the Journal of Building Performance Simulation. And the work here was together was done together with uh, Marie de Klein and Professor Jan Hansen. Um, and later I'll also show a couple of examples that were done in collaboration with uh, researchers from Delft University. Um, so when we speak about building performance simulation. Um, many of you, I, I assume, are users of this software, this type of uh, modeling techniques. And the main reason why we use it is to support design decisions. So really in the design process of actual buildings, can be new developments, can be uh, renovation, and then looking at the design or the uh, sizing of the HVAC systems, for example. And the main reason why this can be beneficial is that we can really investigate, explore, analyze uh, the dynamic interactions between all of these uh, different, well, interacting factors that we see here, um, which, yeah, as you are all aware, is a very complex uh, interplay of different physical interactions um, and includes a range of different scales, both in terms of space and time. Um, what I consider as the main benefit is when it comes to decision making that we can actually uh, use the computer, the power of the computer, the, uh, the way of solving these complex equations to add extra information um, that can well, assist making better decisions during the design. Um, now there is a real push for uh, many years already to move the application of building performance simulation earlier uh, to an earlier stage of the design process. So that would mean here from a more traditional design process represented by line number three to a, what we can call a front loaded design process, uh, which is represented as number four, where the left-hand side of this axis uh, refers to more conceptual design and on the right hand, we think about the detailed design stage. Um, what's the main argument of this figure is that the uh, ability to make changes uh, is large in the beginning. Um, the cost of make, making changes is well increases towards the more detailed stages. So if we can find ways to implement, apply uh, the use of building performance simulation earlier on, we can make better buildings and have them cheaper. Um, so a lot of progress has been made in sustainable buildings, green buildings, so either thinking about the CO2 emissions or thinking about ways of making the indoor environment better. Um, still, if we look at the uh, reports of the 
International Energy Agency, um, and they have this um, website, which would be interesting to look at later if you haven't seen it before, where they track the progress in uh, clean energy. And what they do is looking at different sectors, so it can be industrial or transportation, but especially also buildings, and uh, well, seeing how this meets the, uh, well, the extent at which it meets the policy targets. Um, if we then zoom in on the building sector, what we see is that uh, according to the International Energy Agency, it's far off track with the, with the uh, well, policy targets and really concerted efforts need to take place to be able to yeah, get back on track and meet all the agreements uh, for a better environment and also for the uh, well, health and well-being of people. Um, so what I think is needed to be able to accomplish this is innovation. Um, here I have a figure that is prepared by uh, Arup. Uh, it's already a, a few years old, but I, I think still quite relevant, um, showing different examples of what sort of innovations we can have in future buildings. So the, the range of um, examples here is, is really wide. Um, and also maybe good to keep in mind that sometimes it really doesn't have to be technologically very advanced. It's sometimes just a different way of uh, thinking. Um, but for this type of new innovations to reach the market, um, there is also a lot of uh, decision-making happening by the research and development teams that are in charge or that are yeah, taking care of this sort of new developments, uh, innovations, etc. Um, and then if we look at the uh, development cycle of such a, a new product innovation, then typically we speak in terms of technology readiness levels. So that's indicated here on the horizontal scale, moving from basic research, which typically happens in, uh, well, laboratories, in, in more chemistry or physics sort of environment. And then there is a, a process of scaling up. Um, so going from a, let's say, proof of concept towards a, a bigger scale, then developing that technology, doing all sorts of uh, tests in bigger and bigger scale environment, um, finally reaching the stage of prototypes and system development where also the interest of the uh, private sector actually becomes larger. Um, if we then look at this uh, scale that's indicated on the vertical axis that would indicate the amount of resources that are available, then we see that in the uh, beginning, there's quite a lot of funding uh, for the more fundamental research, uh, really the, the, let's say, laboratory stuff where, where typically not even a, a buildings person is involved. Um, some of these technologies are very promising. They will uh, make it into a successful product. Um, others turn out that that initial idea was actually, well, not that viable. And then it's totally fine if, if no further uh, resources are put in the further development. Um, if we now move to the right-hand side of this graph, uh, this is really where, uh, let's say, the pilots and living labs and that sort of uh, applications are, are being tested. And also there we see that there's quite a lot of funding and resources available, especially for the uh, promising products that we have and the fact that they are soon actually, well, turning into, um, well, there will be a return on the investment. At least that's the idea that if it becomes a successful product that we can build a commercial enterprise around it or that it becomes part of, a, of an existing company that can extend its product portfolio. Um, if you now look at the Red line in this graph, then we see that if in terms of the resources, there is clearly a gap in the middle. And this is sometimes called the valley of death. So indicating that um, there are these promising technologies and there can maybe be many which still need further research and development. Um, 
before they reach a mature stage that they can actually reach the market. Um, but it's very difficult for uh, but the private sector to really start investing in them because they don't actually know very well which of the many ones that are in the early stage are actually the most promising ones. Or another way of saying it is how some of these initial ideas can be in which direction actually they should be developed to have the best match with what the application side, so the uh, the building sector actually needs or, or wants. Um, so then uh, what this, this article and this webinar is about is what if we use building performance simulation to make or to be able to help making this connection from the uh, low technology readiness levels towards the high ones um, by being able to make projections of the performance of, and sometimes they are really, let's say not yet existing products, but we just assume that we already have it there. And then uh, looking at a whole building scale, what is the, uh, the potential of, of such a product and how can we adapt it or modify it in such a way that it improves performance on the uh, actual performance indicators that we are interested in. So for example, if we, we speak about uh, a new window type, for example, then it's quite easy to measure the uh, G value or U value on a reduced scale prototype. But this in itself is often not enough to really develop it in, to know in which direction it should be developed. Because there we really would like to speak in terms of indicators, metrics of performance that are really of interest to the end users. So that, that could be energy costs or the amount of CO2 emissions that are, are reduced. So to really make that sort of mapping or extrapolation towards the full scale in various environments, that's where the potential of simulation using simulation in this stage is. Uh, now for this paper, we did a, a literature review and some of the uh, leading journals that are involved with uh, innovations in materials, not always uh, only specializing on, on building materials, but still often have, having a focus on energy aspects. And if we look into these, these kind of journals, the uh, number of cases where we see the application of uh, building performance simulation to support uh, the development or the R&D process of these kind of products, it's it's almost zero. So um, that's really a, quite a different, the, the people, the type of researchers and R&D teams that are involved uh, in the actual development of the materials, they are very often unaware of the potential of the type of tools uh, that we have been using for, for decades in the uh, building industry. Um, and th this was the motivation for uh, well, do doing the work that led to this uh, paper in this special issue, which has a focus on, on the user of simulation. And maybe here we are representing a not yet existing user or let's say a future audience of this type of uh, simulation programs. And that's then where, where we really are emphasizing. Um, so then talking about the structure of the paper, what we did first um, is a yeah, kind of, I would say, structured analysis of the requirements of this type of simulation users and what they need from how they would interact with uh, building performance simulation models and software. Um, then the, the main core of the article is uh, three different case studies of which I want to uh, introduce two of you to you uh, today. Um, but here, our focus was really not very much on the outcome of the simulation itself or whether the, uh, uh, the technologies that we are investigating are promising that, that for this article, uh, it's pretty much a, a secondary 
concern uh, because the, those, let's say, those more technical results related to the actual prototypes and, and developments have been published elsewhere. Because um, what we really wanted to do then in the end is to come up with recommendations uh, for either simulation users or future users of the simulation programs and also for software developers or so developers of Transis or Energy Plus or eQuest or any of the, the, the widely used simulation programs, how what they can do to make their programs more suitable for that, this public that is really involved in the product development or R&D of new technologies that are not yet on the market. Um, so starting from the uh, requirements analysis, um, if you are not yet familiar with this article, then I would really recommend you to, to take a look at it. Um, so this was done by uh, Professor Osman Balci in the 1980s, actually. So it's already uh, pretty old, um, but it's very systematic um, in terms of, yeah, like it says, the life cycle of a simulation study, uh, starting from what is the problem and how does it reach the modeler on the top, going all the way to how does this decision support using simulation actually reaches the final stakeholder or the decision making. And in this loop, there's a lot of attention for um, for validation. So how to make sure that the outcomes we get actually, well, are what we intend to get, uh, which on the one hand has to do with really the uh, physics that's going on. Um, on the other hand, also has to do with being sure that the data we enter is, uh, is correct. Um, important to notice here that the uh, the background of this study is is not necessarily related to building performance simulation. It's much more um, general type of, of modeling simulation that is being described here. Um, but it gives a very yeah solid uh, framework, and I think especially also many of these steps they are often somehow taken in an implicit way. And if if such a structure as what is proposed here is used, then I think the whole process of delivering this integrated decision support, the final goal we want to get, can be much more uh, streamlined. Um, but what's specifically interesting to, to discuss uh, in the context of the present paper is what we see on the top of this paper, oh sorry, top of the figure is, okay, what's really the uh, kind of question that the this third party has and how do we come to capturing this question in the form of uh, well, a model and the kind of approach, like how, how we use simulation to address that question. So if we then look a bit deeper into um, to the literature around this topic. Um, it's an even older paper here from 1985, uh, where they provide a very structured approach. So first step is to establish the problem domain boundary. Then it's about gathering data, identifying stakeholders and what they are uh, interested in in step four. So the need, uh, needs and objectives. Also listing the constraints and finally specifying the assumptions uh, and making things clear. So this is a very um, linear, simple, straightforward approach. Um, but what is interesting of this overview here is that in my experience, uh, it's never actually like this. So things can are generally much more messy or implicit, or you really need to work hard to, to gather and collect data. So what we actually uh, get and what is also described in the paper in a bit more detail is that instead of this very clear and structured approach, uh, especially in this early R&D context, we very much have to deal with uh, what is called ill-defined problems or sometimes called ill-structured problems, uh, which is also a topic that has been studied for a long time, uh, but basically instead of that, that clear and structured approach, what we have are vaguely stated goals, uh, open-ended problems. So there's not really a clear 
right or wrong. Uh, many things are unstated or sometimes assumed. So for example, the problem constraints and the data that we actually need to be able to come up with an answer uh, is often difficult to uh, assess. So what we are now having is this, uh, on the previous slide, very structured approach that, approach that works very nice with the simulation versus this sort of hard reality. Um, and the approach that uh, that is then being proposed in yeah, this sort of literature that studies uh, uh, requirements, especially, um, is what is called recharacterization of the problem. So to go from the very messy thing on the right-hand side towards something typically through means of simplification that can actually be solved and where the simulation can really yeah, show its added value. Um, so it's a bit abstract what I show here, but uh, I hope that it becomes a bit more clear in the case studies that I'll show later. But this is about redefining aspects of the problem to relate it to the yeah, relevant domain rules and concepts. So really making translation maybe from a more physics or chemistry perspective towards the uh, building energy or building physics uh, concepts. Um, then we need to be, be sure about how are we going to evaluate and how are we deciding which design option or which development direction works best. So this could also be, be said is about thinking about performance indicators. Um, then sometimes we need to reinterpret some of these things in the context of what we actually want to achieve for this specific uh, question that we try to answer using modeling and simulation. And finally, maybe look for analogies or uh, distinguish why this problem is unique and how it can, how, yeah, what we really want to accomplish with it. Um, so then moving from these uh, sort of more conceptual requirements oriented approach, um, what we did is trying to be systematic about why is it challenging to use building performance simulation in this sort of explorative uh, R&D context, really referring to product development of, of new building envelope components or maybe new uh, H HVAC systems. Um, and there's a couple of them that we identified that I want to discuss with you. Um, first of them is that often in these uh, early phases, there's really a mismatch between what information is there and what does the interface of my uh, BPS software actually need? Um, so often things have simply not been decided um, or is available in a kind of different, let's say scale or uh, different properties have been measured or it's not measured to, not possible to measure a certain type of properties. So this really mapping between what do I want and what can I give as an input to my simulation software that uh, can be a challenge. Um, then I think the biggest challenge is that the really models, so the, the physical models that are embedded in the simulation programs um, have limitations and these limitations are very much targeted towards existing products, existing materials um, and it's difficult to often to model something that does not yet exist. Because the reason is that the developer of this software never thought about the fact that you would one day try to use this software to model that. Um, so uh, later as a case study, I will give an example of a new window system that can change its uh, transparency for uh, near infrared sunlight as a function of time or temperature or whatever control signal is given. And in many simulation programs, uh, it is simply impossible to model that or you really need to uh, think of a, a workaround or sometimes even uh, change some well, some lines in the source code of the simulation tools to be able to do that. Um, but what I want to highlight also is that once you really start digging a bit deeper in the algorithms and the equations that are being solved, that uh, 
very often it, it is actually possible to use some sort of creative modeling and simulation strategy and that many technologies and materials actually can be uh, covered. Then we have the issue that the output of the simulation is not always uh, perceived as informative, which simply can have to do with a, a lack of trust in models. Um, there are materials developers, especially that, that really believe only in empirical evidence. They say, okay, a model is just a model. How can I know that this actually makes sense? So the, I've experienced this, that it can sometimes be hard to really convince uh, a collaborator from the fact that the results we get from a well-trusted simulation program such as Energy Plus, like what, what's the type of belief or trust that we can have in, in those uh, outputs. So that, that's sometimes uh, important to, to really be transparent about the assumptions, about the kind of confidence that we can have and what the input is of uh, different boundary conditions or occupant behavior, etc. cetera. Um, then a more process related challenge is uh, it takes time to run a good simulation and to be confident in the quality of the results. Uh, whereas in this type of processes, there's often really a desire to be quick. So be, being able to, to match the complexity level of detail that goes into the simulation model with this requirement for uh, yeah, quick feedback, I would say that it's a challenge. Another challenge is that uh, many things are changing, especially in this uh, low technology readiness levels. Um, it's sometimes not even sure which problem we are trying to solve with a new material and new technology. And at the same time, for many practical reasons, this uh, solution can also develop. So it happened uh, that we were very busy doing all sorts of simulations, but because of other more practical technical considerations, the whole idea of the product had, had already been yeah, updated, modified. So that, that's also a challenge in relation to the need for quick feedback. Um, then often there are people, team members with uh, very different backgrounds. Um, so just, for example, if you are uh, doing a, a daylight simulation and you want to express your, your results in terms of useful daylight illuminance or daylight glare probability or that sort of, performance indicators, uh, there can just be a communication gap with other team members, right? So really thinking about how to transform the results of the uh, what the simulation program gives you into something that can really be used to, to make informed design decisions. That's also a challenge. Um, and then the final two is that when we think about uh, product development, often, there is no building yet. There's no proposed building. So then we need to maybe work with a reference building, but what will that reference building be? And does it actually matter how it is defined? Because maybe that might lead to, uh, to different suggestions for how to proceed in the development. And this, But you need to have a building to be able to run that simulation, right? Because we talk about the whole building performance here, not so much on the component level. Um, and finally, the same applies to the, yeah, what I call here application area, but probably we can summarize it as the kind of climate or location or urban context. Also, this uh, has not been defined, uh, but to be able to run that simulation, you need to make decisions here, which yeah, need to be really aligned with the overall objectives of what we want to accomplish. So if I then move to the case studies, and there are two I want to discuss here today, um, and they have mostly to do with my interest and background and various projects I did in the past and currently still carrying on about uh, adaptive facades. So the idea is that the weather is constantly changing, seasons and day-night effects, uh, but building envelopes are typically static, constant over time. So if we were able to be able to control the physical properties, then the idea is that we can really yeah, upgrade building performance. 
Um, on this website, I'm maintaining an overview with different examples. Currently, uh, there should be more than 500 uh, in this list, um, but it's continually, continuously improving, expanding. There's always new ideas or new developments. And that's where I want to discuss uh, two examples today. So the first one is a concept that we called convective concrete. Um, the idea is that if we put more and more uh, insulation in, in buildings in, well, this is mostly talking about uh, the Netherlands where I am, but I think it, it speaks for a wider uh, geographical area. If we put more and more insulation, it works really well for reducing heat losses. Um, as a side effect, we trap a lot of the heat. It cannot escape, and these buildings tend to overheat uh, much more easily. And if we then start installing uh, air conditioning equipment to counterbalance this effect, then well, we basically lose all the benefits of having that reduced heating demand through more insulation. So the idea here is to um, use a special way of um, 3D printing to um, create a, a building slab with uh, they're basically ducts embedded. And now if we activate the fans that we see that you can see here on the section, for example, during a, a night in summer, then the idea is that we can charge this thermal mass that will be on the inside of the insulation layer with cool air from the outside and that we can then absorb more heat gains during daytime by activating the, the fan on the interior side during, uh, during daytime. So this becomes some sort of heat exchanger uh, that takes, well, so there's no air mixing involved, but it takes the air from the outside to cool down the thermal mass so that it can absorb more during the next day, really taking advantage of the uh, thermal storage capacity of this concrete slab. Um, so this was just a, a very conceptual idea. Um, and then really very quickly, uh, let's say in, in this step four, five, six, seven, many questions uh, came up. So how can we optimize the arrangements of the ducts? What sort of concrete mix should be applied? Uh, how to control the operation? What's actually the performance when we integrate it into a building and compare it to a baseline situation, what sort of climates, um, what sort of building types, and this, this list uh, goes on and on. Um, and what we did is using Mulligan simulation to answer a, a number of these uh, questions at various stages of the uh, uh, R&D development. Um, and I just want to emphasize once again that the 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 purpose of this paper uh, was not so much on, in, in really presenting those concepts and prototypes in detail, but it's really kind of trying to um, abstract from it some more general rules and principles and of how simulation can be helpful and what are pitfalls uh, in this context. Um, but just going through the simulation examples, they were carried out at three different levels. Um, the first one, just looking at the component scale, um, where we use this software called Energy 2D to study the uh, two-dimensional dynamic heat transfer through uh, such a construction element. And here particularly trying to optimize the arrangements of duct. So we, we look here at the, at the horizontal cross section uh, where we study the uh, the heat flux and actually figuring out that this uh, aligned arrangement has a better, um, it better utilizes the heat storage capacity. Then a second issue that we were uh, facing is because we were also this project was carried out in collaboration with a concrete developer is what sort of uh, thermal phys physical properties uh, of the concrete would be ideal for uh, yeah, this type of system. So on the one hand, we want to have a high thermal storage capacity 
so that we can really charge these thermal masts. Um, on the other hand, what was very important is the speed, the rate at which we can yeah, either charge or discharge, because we can have a very large storage, but if we are not able to, to extract from that storage, then it's also not going to be helpful. Um, so in, in trying to find find a balance, especially here between the uh, the density of the concrete and the thermal conductivity, which could also be influenced by by putting some additives, we use that same uh, energy 2D program as I showed before to um, to analyze the the thermal time constant of the concrete, um, where it was then well at least. This sort of figures can maybe not directly pinpoint a single um, solution, but it's really helpful for communication because we can really see what is the effect if we move in one direction and in the other direction. And well, there are many non-linearities here. Um, so that, that's, I think, another point I want to highlight that using the simulation is not necessarily always for saying like, okay, you should go for uh, that option, one specific one, but it's very much for for make, making it quantifiable and having this discussion based on numbers, based on results, rather than just based on on intuition. Um, but then I think the the most important and interesting thing here is uh, the whole building simulation. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, the types of programs like Transis or Energy Plus, then as a user, I can give the thickness of the material, I can give the uh, well, thermal conductivity, specific heat capacity and the density, but I have no way of saying, okay, I want to send air through it and then like, like the way this convective concrete uh, is supposed to work. Um, at least this is true for just the basic way of modeling uh, building envelopes in, in Energy Plus specifically, that's the program we used here. Um, but then if you look a bit deeper in, in what the options are, then you will find that there's an option um, which is used for ventilated slabs. Um, so they are typically uh, floor plates that are used to transport uh, conditioned air. So either heated air or cooled air as a way of like a, a conditioning system for the building. Um, and what we did is we took this template of the uh, ventilated slab and then adapted it a bit in such a way that um, it can be useful for a vertical, like a, a wall system. And also um, while making some changes to the way it is the airflow is controlled so that there's no heating or cooling and that we are able to to really ac activate the airflow when we want it based on the uh, energy balance and thermal considerations. Um, when we do that, we can uh, really study the uh, well heat transfer uh, building physics of uh, this type of system and actually demonstrate why it would make sense to uh, to apply such uh, technology um, and also studying the impact of uh, airflow rates, for example. So this is the the amount of air that would go through these uh, ducts that are integrated in the facade element. Um, again, no real hard conclusions, just to show how this type of analysis can help in the communication with the other uh, team members. And what we also did is, uh, which is something that is really very hard to do through actual experiments, is to test the performance. Um, in this case, this is for a, a sleeping room um, where we see, where we analyze in different climates, which in reality is very hard to do. In simulation, it's basically just changing uh, one small setting. Um, so we have a baseline case here, we compare it to being able to open the window when we have a very immediate effect of reducing or uh, well, getting rid of the warm air, but not really being able to 
charge the thermal mass so that it can absorb heat during the next day. That's where the benefit of uh, convective concrete comes in. And we see that there's really quite a large uh, influence of what is low and high, which here has to do with the, uh, the mass flow rate of air that is sent through these ducts. Um, and then yeah, having an insight of which climate is the most promising. Something we did in, in parallel, and um, it is related to this whole domain of uh, building performance simulation, but maybe not exactly a modeling and simulation study, um, is looking only at the weather files that we have available. And you may be familiar with uh, software like Climate Consultant, for example, that is really very useful for analyzing uh, weather files like these uh, EPW files, for example, but it's actually quite limited in supporting what well, giving guidance about the performance of this sort of uh, innovative ideas. Um, but if you take these weather files and you post-process them, post them in a, in a separate environment, can be MATLAB or Python or even Excel, can be very helpful, then still we can do a couple of useful things. So what we did here is taking the average daytime temperature and sorting this um, over the 365 days of the year. So then we can already very quickly get an idea of the number of days that, uh, for example, the average temperature is above 25 degrees, which never happens in Belfast and Bergen, sometimes in Amsterdam and Warsaw, and really much more often in uh, Milan, Rome, and Naples and Madrid. So this really quickly led us to yeah, narrow down the application range where this can potentially be an interesting solution. Um, even more if we combine this, so now the, the solid lines um, that we have here are the same ones as you saw before. We just zoom a bit, bit in on the first, or let's say the warmest 100 days. Um, and now the triangles, they give an indication of the temperature difference between day and night, because that, that's really where we think that the application potential of this technology would be. And using this sort of combination um, of data analysis, we can quickly yeah, inform the design team of where is the highest application potential. And then finally, this led to um, the development of, of this prototype, um, where the idea is that the, the thing you see on the left is a cast. Uh, so we will pour concrete here. The elements that are there are made of a wax material. So if we heat, then the um, system, uh, the wax will melt and we end up with the hollow core system that can get the uh, fan to circulate the air. Um, then I would like to use maybe five minutes to quickly also show the uh, second case study, which is on a quite different area. Um, so previously we spoke about opaque elements here. It's about um, transparent parts, so windows. And it's based on some uh, earlier work that we did together with uh, a research group in the chemistry department here at uh, Eindhoven University. Um, and the idea is that um, if we look at the solar irradiance, then roughly 50% of it consists of, or 50% of the energy uh, consists of radiation that our eyes cannot see. Um, so if you're able to control the transparency of this glass to, to uh, either admit the infrared radiation when we need it, when it's useful for passive solar heating, or if we can reflect it on warmer days to the outside. That's, let's say, the, the basic concept, um, this idea. And so our colleagues in the chemistry department, they are actually making this. They are experimenting um, with it. And for them, it's really hard to, to decide what is the direction that we should go. And in this collaboration, we use yeah, really these projections using 
building performance simulation to give make sense of what is the direction to go. So quickly to uh, remind you of this uh, solar spectrum, uh, the visible light is roughly between uh, 380 and 700 nanometers, and then everything above the 700 to 2500 is the what we call the near infrared sunlight. And we, depending on if we think is useful for the building, we want to reflect this light. Which, if we look at the uh, uh, transmission spectrum of the glass, looks something like this. So we have a blue state, which is mostly transparent uh, throughout the whole wavelength range. And we have a yellow state that is uh, reflecting. And in this way, we can control the solar heat gain coefficient of the glass over time. Um, now, what we see here is the kind of initial version of this technology. And then we were thinking, so the the wider we make the difference between the transparent and the reflecting one, the bigger the effect will be in terms of uh, glazing properties. So there are basically two ways of doing it, going in the vertical direction or going in the horizontal direction. Um, due to the constraints of the material that uh, we were working with, it's not really possible to go into the uh, vertical direction, so option A. Um, Going in option B is an option, um, but there, the risk is that if we go too far to the left, that actually um, the well the, the change in reflectance uh, becomes visible to the eye. So that will mean that we get like a pink or red looking glazing, and probably this is really undesirable from a building application perspective. But if I go back one slide, we can see that in this range, just around 750 nanometers, there's actually quite a bit of energy in that part. So what was the task here is to look at what will happen if we are additionally able to uh, reflect that part that is indicated here in the gray area. Um, so it's very quick and easy to calculate what happens to the G value or solar heat heating coefficient, but here we were specifically interested in knowing what happens to the uh, energy use of this building. So then uh, simulation was done to compare this transparent reflecting and uh, reflecting plus, or that would here then be indicated in um, a low E glazing as a reference case. So this is always done for a, a reference office building in the Netherlands, which has a climate file, which has also the um, uh, occupant behavior, so it, it's a full simulation, um, but we, we only vary the glazing properties in this case. And what we see is that if we move to the switchable plus, is that the added value that can be gained by doing this is roughly in the same order of magnitude, if I go one back, one back here. So if you move from blue to yellow, and and then we additionally move from yellow to red. What we gain from the, this last step is almost equal to this much bigger area uh, that we would get in moving from blue to yellow, which seems quite counterintuitive from looking at this figure, but is explained by the fact that close to this 700, 750 nanometer range, there's much more energy actually in the sunlight. And this was very interesting point in the discussion with the uh, material scientist because it's something that's maybe not immediately uh, intuitive. So then uh, as a conclusion, um, well, there are three points. So first I have some, some general conclusions and then uh, points of attention and finally some recommendation also for software developers. Um, so also in the interest of time, maybe the points here, they are, this is just a copy paste from the paper. And I think I have addressed uh, many of the points that are here. And I think it's more interesting to discuss some of the other ones that are the points of attention and recommendation. So I hope that I gave you some convincing examples that simulation can be very helpful in this R&D stage. Um, at the same time, it's important to realize that this is not a silver bullet solution. So it doesn't work always. And also it should not be the only tool 
uh, that we are using. So it, the combination with actual experiments actually is very valuable, I would say. Um, if you use simulation, it's very important that there is sufficient time and resources to actually do a decent job. Otherwise, it will probably even uh, backfire. And the other important thing is that, yeah, you need to really know the physics that is going on uh, to be able to interpret the results. And the other way around, so just trusting the simulation results to try to, let's see, then understand what, what the results are is probably not the right way to go. Um, then also a lesson that we learned here is that it's really important to think about how to communicate these results and think about visualization methods or ways of presenting the results so that they are can be interpreted by different audiences with different, let's say, engineering or technical backgrounds or even more general public. So this is a very important step to think about how to do this. And the last point of attention is what is sometimes called the complexity pitfall. Um, so if you think about this graph here, um, we have model complexity and we have a potential error in the performance prediction. So the more we move to complex models, uh, the smaller the error is going to be due to our approximation of reality. Um, but what is sometimes forgotten is that to be able to run that complex model, as a user, we need to give many properties, assumptions, uh, etc., of things we have no information about. So actually the uncertainty due to estimation goes up when we move to more complex models, which might mean that the most appropriate model or the one that minimizes this error is actually not the one with the highest complexity, but perhaps somewhere in between, um, where with sometimes with effort, we can reduce this uncertainty uh, by getting more information about the input parameters. But in general, I would say to think about fit for purpose modeling complexity, that's a very important point of attention or recommendation. And as a last slide, um, probably the listeners of this webinar are not the right audience, because uh, I assume there are not too many software developers, but still, I think it's interesting to think about what sort of recommendations we have there. Um, so I think that it would be very interesting to have more capabilities for doing this visualization with weather files, because I think it's a very powerful tool to quickly pinpoint what sort of locations and applications are interesting. Then if we can somehow have this hierarchic model formulations that can really yeah, develop together with the technology. So at the beginning, there's maybe little information and then we use a rough model, but once the technology develops, if we can reuse that same model formulation, but at a higher uh, level of resolution, that will be very interesting as a concept. Then sometimes it's issue that not all the assumptions or source code is actually available to the uh, simulation user. And this really limits the application of certain uh, building performance simulation softwares, especially in this yeah, innovation support. Um, it would be very nice if there were new or additional results visualizations, maybe also not just annual results, uh, but at a higher uh, temporal resolution or different spatial scales. Um, control strategies are very important, especially in this adaptive or responsive facade context. So yeah, to extend to these possibilities, that would be really nice to have. And finally, um, it's not something that I really highlighted today, but having the ability to do sensitivity analysis and well, the propagation of uncertainty, that's really powerful in the communication. It would be nice if that's better integrated with the uh, simulation software. Um, and that was all I wanted to discuss with you today. So if there are any questions, I would be happy to uh, address them. Thank you.
Uh, thanks, gentlemen. I invite uh, attendees to send me a question for question team table on your panel. And depending upon your question, I can unmute you or you can repeat it. And any questions from the audience? Yes, we have uh, one question coming from Alfonso. Um, can I unmute you, Alfonso? Do you have a microphone here? Yes. Yes, I have uh, unmuted you. You can ask the question directly. Alfonso, can you hear me? are unmuted <laughs> oh, there you go <laughs> okay <laughs> hi uh, so i was wondering if um i mean the the locations for case study one were all in europe and mm -hmm. uh, i'm in the south of the united states and uh, we get uh, a lot more uh, higher uh, relative humidity in the air and whenever we attempt something a little more uh, on the radiant side uh, we you know, find the, the problem of, of condensation because sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, the surfaces, surfaces uh, um, cooling below dew points. So I was wondering if there was, if that was a consideration for that particular case study. All right. Um, actually, yes, it was. Um, so, and yeah, maybe it's interesting to especially talk also about the uh, the stimulation side of things. Um, so what is interesting is that uh, Energy Plus even has a built-in, let's say, flag or warning that checks when the surface temperature comes below the dew point temperature. So to avoid any risk of condensation, or if that happens, it will um, not turn on the fan. Um, what we saw that in the context where these simulations were done, so that was indeed uh, with the European focus, we did not observe this as a problem, or at least it was not having an impact on the performance of the system. Um, but at the same time, yes, I can understand that there are different uh, climatic conditions where trying to cool down the uh, building envelope surfaces is really very risky uh, and very, well, the, the consequences can be very high. So it's also, uh, we, we really want to avoid taking these sort of risks. Um, but I think that the simulation tools can actually be very powerful to to handle, to, uh, to be able to analyze and to quantify what is the risk. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes, we have from Simon. Okay. Uh, Simon, can I unmute you? Hey, let me let me do that. Simon, you can ask a question. Oh, you don't have mic. Okay. Um, so, on behalf of Simon Tucker, I am asking questions. You found ways of modeling at the various scales. Have you had any situation where you could not model some aspect that you would like to? Um, it's a good question, but so one of the things um, that come to my mind now is that in the uh, first case study that I showed today, there were also people from the uh, structural domain involved. And what we did here is very much emphasizing on comfort or heat transfer and energy considerations. 
um, but it's very hard to do this sort of yeah, multidisciplinary view to quantify or to be able to analyze what, what's the impact on how to actually construct it or to, to think about the uh, strength and, and other structural uh, considerations. So I think that, that would really be something for on the uh, wish list to have this cross-domain or multidisciplinary approach so that we can really find this trade-off solution that, that satisfies yeah, the different professions that are involved in, in developing such a technology. Because what would happen now is that then the, the structures uh, consultant or, or researchers would use a different modeling formulation in a completely different type of software. And it's very hard to, to link the results of one to the other. So if there would be this somehow multi-physics software approach, I think that would really be a, a major step forward in this field. Thanks. That was the that was the that is the next question coming from Beharang. Beharang, uh, if you wish you can ask question directly. I have unmuted you. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation and uh, actually for the results you found. My concern is that did you find any difference between different, for example, building simulation software? Uh, it, was there any difference, for example, between uh, the model in Energy Plus and Transis or some some other one? So did you find anything or did you study this? Um, so in, in parallel to this, uh, we have another paper where we um, reviewed the capabilities of different simulation platforms. Um, so there was Energy Plus, trends is uh, ESPR, ISVE, and IDA ICE, where, where we looked at the capabilities and then specifically looking at these uh, adaptive facades, so the, the examples that I, I showed here. Um, and I think it's important to be aware that um, yeah, many of these new ideas, it's, it's not necessarily straightforward to uh, find a way to integrate them into those um, simulation software, especially if they have an interface that is kind of closed. Um, so in this case, we, we just looked around at what are the different um, capabilities of the tools. And then for this first example, we, we found this um, uh, ventilated slab option in Energy Plus. So somebody else already had in the past implemented something similar so that that could immediately be useful. Um, it would be fundamentally impossible to model this same system in, in transits and this has to do with the fact that it uses a conduction transfer function method for modeling the uh, transient heat transfer and it, it's not really possible there to, to look inside the, the multi-layer construction. So you, you only look at the edges and therefore it's, it's not possible to, let's say, manipulate the heat transfer in a way, let's say, of extracting or adding thermal energy to this uh, layer of concrete like we do here in, uh, which can be done in Energy Plus. So, so specifically, uh, yes, there is a difference and in a, wider sense, I would say, uh, yeah, look at um, software manuals. There, There's quite a lot written, um, especially also look at um, internet forums. So I think uh, Unmet Hours now is full of, uh, of wisdom of various uh, researchers uh, who have shared their questions and ideas. And also in the, uh, the mailing list and the entire archive there's many well very likely there was somebody else before you, for you if you have like a, a problem at hand that was dealing with something very similar and was maybe already uh, addressed there so that that will be my advice in a wider scale to make sure of of the internet archives that you really check uh, what is there and uh, i 
Kanjan, would you like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes, hear you very well. Yeah. Uh, so I would go for average daytime temperature plot. Uh, can you open that slide, please? Um, yes, maybe this one. Uh, yeah, this one. So I would expect it more to be a bell shape. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm just having a hard time understanding why the um, first day does not correspond to like the 365th day. Uh, what am I missing here? Um, so what you are seeing here, and I didn't explain it, is that um, these days are sorted from high to low, right? So we mm -hmm. see like a, like a duration curve. If you want, so so the first day is not first of January, but first the first day here is the warmest day of the year, um, and then it moves to the oh, right. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, okay, I got it. Listen, we are not getting any other question now. Uh, so thanks for offering this webinar. It's pretty interesting. Uh, and I request again attendees to register for the simulation conference and also support uh, by making supporting uh, I thank Lunan for all his efforts and offering this particular webinar. Uh, thank you, Lunan, and with this, I end this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you.